Hello, my name is Chris Mack, and I'm going to give you a talk that I gave last week at the SPIE Advanced Lithography Symposium. Uh, I can't reproduce the talk exactly, but uh, this will be a close facsimile of what I said at the conference. My co-author is Ben Bundy of Semitech. The title of this talk, Analytical Line Scan Model for SEM Metrology. The reason we embarked on this effort was to try to improve the way that we extract information from a scanning electron microscope image. In particular, we use these images to measure the critical dimension, or CD. Uh, often, our edge detection and CD measurement algorithms are really quite crude. They're very simple uh, threshold or, or linear fit kinds of algorithms, uh, but they're mostly effective. Unfortunately, there's a lot of the physics of what goes on in forming uh, an SEM image that is completely ignored by the use of these algorithms. And the, and the physics tends to affect the shape of these line scans, they're called, the, the images themselves, in a way that adds bias and uncertainty to the CD measurements that we're making. Now, one approach to solve this problem is to use very rigorous physical calculations of how electrons interact with the sample and form the image. We could use Monte Carlo simulations, for example. But these are extremely computationally intensive and time-consuming kinds of calculations. That makes them too slow for any uh, real-time work in, in particular for working the inverse problem of where you have an image and you're trying to understand the shape of the object that produced that image, which is what CD metrology is all about. So the purpose of this work is to try to investigate a middle way, something that incorporates physics, at least uh, uh, some or most of the physics involved in forming an SEM image, but is based on a simple analytical equation that can be inverted. That is, it can be fit to experimental data to extract CD measurements. This is not work that is completed. Uh, we still have a long ways to go, but this is some of the early uh, results from that investigation. The basis of this will be a, a virtual SEM tool, that is an SEM simulator. We're going to use a, a program called JMonsel uh, that was developed at NIST, John Villaruba, and uh, it has all kinds of, of known, best known physical models built into it for the scattering of electrons, the generation of, of secondary electrons, and then the uh, detection of those to create a signal. The output is a simulated line scan, uh, such as depicted down here. And of course, repeating that multiple times uh, across a feature gives us a simulated SEM image as this. We'll use this to generate or predict what we would think uh, an output of an SEM would be. But because we're using simulation instead of experiment, we know exactly what the input is. That is, we know exactly the geometry of the, the shapes that we're measuring. In other words, we know the answer ahead of time. And this will help us to understand how good our measurement of that SEM, simulated SEM image will be compared to what we know the input is. We're going to derive, using this Monte Carlo simulation output, the analytical line scan model, or ALM. We'll fit this line scan model to uh, the Monte Carlo results, and then look at how these model parameters vary with wafer geometries. Now, this is a continuation of a previous work. Uh, last year, at the same conference, Ben and I uh, first proposed uh, the analytical line scan model, but it was limited, limited to a silicon substrate. We looked only at 50 nanometer tall steps. We didn't look at any other heights. The steps were made up of either silicon or PMMA, and they were isolated. Uh, we didn't try to put two edges together to create a feature. We did look at three different voltages in both ideal point and Gaussian incident beams. Here, we're only going to look at one voltage, 500 volts, but we're going to vary the step height over a wide range between 10 and 100 nanometers. 
we're going to vary the sidewall angle over a wide range. And then we're going to combine edges to make lines and spaces, various pitches in various duty cycles. Let's look at uh, the basics of how this model is derived. All the details of the derivation are provided in excruciating detail in the written manuscript uh, that will be a part of the proceedings of the conference that we presented this paper at. But let me give you a feel for what the basics are. So I've got some, some geometry, some step in this case, and I impinge electrons at a particular point and then uh, the image is made up of a detected number of secondary electrons that escape from uh, the sample after these electrons impinge at this point in the sample. So what happens to the electrons when it goes into the sample? In this case, they're going into the silicon wafer. Well, they, they scatter and deposit energy. We're going to model that energy as a double Gaussian, a forward scatter range, and a back scatter range. Now, this, this energy produces secondary electrons, and when those secondary electrons are produced very near the surface, we get uh, escaping of those secondaries and then detection of them. Now, when this beam travels closer to the edge, the edge starts to influence uh, the number of secondaries that become detected. Why? Because some of these backscattered electrons, for example, might be absorbed by the step. I mean, not all of them, because some of those might escape. Also, some of the secondary electrons that escape from the surface might be absorbed by the step. All of these factors influence the change in the secondary electron signal as the electron beam approaches the step. Likewise, we can think of the same kind of phenomena happening when the electrons hit the top of the step. Uh, but we have a, one other mechanism. When electrons are impinging on the top, say here, some of those electrons can escape out the sidewall. In fact, we'll get an enhancement uh, of the number of electrons that escape because of, the, because of that sidewall. And that's why we see a bright edge corresponding to our sidewall. Well, in our previous work, we derived uh, one expression for a step. And this is that long equation. You see it's got exponentials and complementary error functions. It may look complicated, but it is an analytical expression. You can plug it into Excel. You can write a little piece of software and generate uh, a simulated line scan almost instantly. So it's very convenient for our uses. It has 11 parameters. All of them are physically based. Uh, they all make sense physically. We have uh, also one, we have one of those 11 parameters. That's the incident Gaussian beam width, uh, one sigma. But all the rest are beam material interaction parameters. They are a function of the voltage, so they change when you change the, the voltage. And not all of them are equally important. Here's an example of the fit from uh, last year's talk. Uh, you see in the red smooth curve the uh, analytical line scan model best fit to the data. And you see in the blue uh, jagged curve the Monte Carlo simulations. It's, it's a fit almost to within the noise of, of the simulation. Uh, so it's, it's a very, very uh, good quality fits. Uh, we looked at a number of conditions, and they all give the same kind of good quality fits. Well, that's the, the results from the previous work. Now we're going to extend that work by looking at some other conditions. And the first thing we're going to look at is varying the step height. Uh, we're only using 500 volts here, but now we're going to look at how, say, the wafer forward scatter range or the wafer forward scatter absorption parameter, two of the parameters from that previous model, change as a function of the step height. Here I'm showing silicon wafer with a silicon step, uh, but we also have the results for a PMMA step over a silicon wafer. And what we see is that we get a quick rise in this parameter until we reach about a steady state, not quite steady, but close to steady value at thicker step heights, bigger step heights. Um, essentially about 20 nanometers is the cutoff, and for step heights of 20 nanometers or, or larger, we don't have to worry about the influence of the step height on that parameter. 
Now that number is going to be voltage dependent if I have a 800 volt landing uh, voltage for example then those electrons will penetrate more and uh, maybe it'll be 25 nanometers or some larger number uh, as the, the cutoff. Uh, likewise for lower voltage we, we would expect this step height transition region to be at thinner step heights, thinner materials. One exception was the wafer backscatter range parameter and we found that that was linear with the step height both for the silicon step and the PMMA step. Well we can understand that and see that when we think about one of the mechanisms of backscatter range that is the uh, how close to the step can the electrons go before the step starts to influence it. Well that depends on how tall the step is and if, if secondary electrons being injected from the silicon wafer surface are being absorbed by that step well you can only imagine that a taller step will absorb more of them and a shorter step will absorb less of them and so this wafer backscatter range will be linearly dependent upon that step height for purely geometrical reasons, shadowing effect and that's what we observe. We also vary the sidewall angle now here's a case where uh, you have the silicon wafer on, in this region and uh, the top of the step uh, on this side uh, and then in between you've got the, the sidewall region itself. Uh, for a 20 nanometer step that's a 20 nanometer length of sidewall region for our sidewall angle of 45 degrees which I show here just to give you kind of an extreme case to make it easier to see. What we find is that the tilted edge has its own secondary electron background signal which I call SE edge that corresponds to uh, how a, 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 a long region of, of tilted sidewall how many secondaries would be emitted and then we have this kind of fall off and rise uh, to either side of that and as a result uh, the model shown at the bottom of the page covers this sidewall region. But also the other parameters change as a function of the sidewall angle. In particular the cosine of the sidewall angle. Well we can see that because uh, things like wafer backscatter absorption by the step will change if I have a slope step compared to a, a vertical step. So we, we see many of the parameters varying uh, linearly as a function of cosine the sidewall angle or 1 minus cosine the sidewall angle sometimes uh, other powers of cosine um, but we're able to create models to predict how these parameters change with sidewall angle. The result is a model that can fit over a range of sidewall angles. Here I show an 80 degree sidewall angle and the red is the fit and the blue is the Monte Carlo results and again we get very very excellent fits over a wide range of step heights and sidewall angles. Well now we're ready to combine two edges together to create a feature. Now the first thing you might try to do and the first thing I did was to combine two edges that had been calibrated uh, just as isolated edges, the kind of thing we, sh we just finished showing. I won't change any of the parameters, I'll simply put those two edges together so that if electrons are landing in a particular spot they're influenced by the edge on the right and the edge on the left uh, because of, of, in this case, a repeating pattern of lines and spaces. Here I show 30 nanometer tall silicon features of 15 nanometer line width and then I vary the pitch, 100 nanometers and 30 nanometers. And what I find is while I get a qualitative match to the shape of these line scans, I do not get a quantitative match. In particular, I get a poor quantitative match for the uh, small pitch patterns or the small space patterns. You see that when my pitch is 100, I get a much better match. It's only a little bit off, but when my pitch is 30, the, the line scan model shown in red is quite a bit different from the blue Monte Carlo results. 
Well, there's a reason for that. The reason is small spaces trap electrons. If electrons, uh, especially coming out of the top uh, through the sidewall, um, but also electrons escaping out of the bottom of that step, when they leave, they can be absorbed by the step. But if I have two steps, that is a small space, two steps close to each other, I get more absorption. Uh, they don't escape as easily. This is mostly a function of the size of the step. So we were able to create a simple model to account for this by changing just two parameters. The, the background secondary electron signal at the bottom of the step, in the, in the space region that is, and the enhancement effect, uh, enhancement factor for the step edge. How much escaping do the electrons do out of the side wall uh, given an electron beam hitting at the top of the feature. Both of these will be a function of the space width because of the sp smaller space is trapping. And we find that the, this simple exponential uh, equations match the simulation results. Here's uh, those graphs showing the blue symbols, uh, the, the Monte Carlo best fit results, and the red curve, uh, the models shown below. The result now is a feature model that can take into account different step heights and line widths and pitches and sidewall angles. Uh, all, not quite all, but many of the things that uh, of course we expect to vary from feature to feature as we're measuring them in a scanning electron microscope. Well, now that we have a completed model that takes all these things into account, let's try it out. Uh, here is the fits to the Monte Carlo results when we include this um, two parameter change uh, that is dependent upon the state space width. You see that we get very good fits and we, we tried this for a large number of feature sizes and pitches and we got uh, results close to this for almost all of the cases. So let's test out this analytical line scan model. What we'll do here is create, again, a virtual SEM, but give the line scan, um, the noisy line scan, to the analytical line scan model and ask the model to fit and extract out the CD and sidewall angle. So here's what we did. We took a 10 nanometer line on a 20 nanometer pitch and uh, we, we created a noiseless line scan as predicted by the Monte Carlo simulator um, shown in the black with a point beam and in the red dashed with a, a typical Gaussian beam size. Then we added noise in varying amounts so that we could have really noisy images and only slightly noisy images, etc. And we, and we created a whole bunch of different noise uh, instantiations to be the equivalent of making multiple measurements. They all have the same underlying line scan, but different noises added to it. Given that, we'll measure how wide this feature is using the line scan. We'll do that um, with the analytical line scan model by fitting the model to the noisy data allowing only two parameters to vary, the input CD or the, and the, the sidewall angle. So uh, here's an example. The input CD for the Monte Carlo to generate our noisy line scan was 10 nanometers. And the measured CD I got by fitting the analytical line scan model to that virtual line scan was 9.98 nanometers. The input sidewall angle was 89 degrees, and the measured sidewall angle here was 89.0 degrees. So a very good fit for this level of noise. We repeated this exercise multiple times and calculated uh, a mean and standard deviation of the CD and the sidewall angle that resulted. The mean allows us to calculate a bias. So is there a bias between uh, the numbers extracted and the true numbers that we input in the model. And we then compared the biases for the analytical line scan model 
to two other models. First, a threshold model where we set the, set the threshold at 25%. And then a linear regression where we picked some range and fit a straight line uh, through it and then said the 50% point was the CD. Let's take a look first at the graph on the left. This is the CD bias. So uh, if we fit a large number of these features, we get an average CD. And we compare that average CD to the input CD, we have a bias. You see that all of these have relatively small biases. The threshold um, has a positive bias, where the, whereas the analytical line skin model has a negative bias. Um, the n equal to 1,000 means there's only a little bit of noise. n equal to 250 means there's a lot of noise. And so the bias goes up with the amount of noise, as you might expect. Now for the analytical line scan model, we have in green also the results in degrees of the bias of the sidewall angle as well. So on the order of 0.05 degrees. Probably more important than the bias is the relative precision. That is the standard deviation of all of the measurements that were made for all of these simulated noisy line scans. And you can see that the analytical line scan model has by far the lowest standard deviation. Uh, that is the highest precision. Uh, we also show in the orange the precision results for the sidewall angle. You can see that's on the order of uh, 0.1 degrees, um, but the precision of the CD measurements themselves are in incredibly good and much better than the other algorithms. Well, this is quite promising. We've developed in this work a very simple analytical line scan model that matches rigorous Monte Carlo simulations over a variety of feature sizes, heights, and sidewall angles. The final model has 17 physically based parameters and we can calibrate them uh, just using isolated edges uh, for the most part and two of the parameters we have to uh, look at varying space widths as well. The result is very, very good um, match of the analytical line scan model to the Monte Carlo simulations and at least our very early and initial studies showed that it could do a good job of extracting CDs from a simulated noisy line scan image. Now I expect that uh, we don't need to use all 17 of these parameters to get a good result. Um, in fact, uh, many of those parameters are, have only a minor impact on the shape of the line scan and can probably be neglected. Uh, so uh, an interesting question is, what is the most simplified version of the model that is still adequate? That's a topic of future work. Also, what would be the best calibration procedure for a given set of materials in the SEM. And finally, how accurately will the model extract feature size and sidewall angle from a real world line scan, not one of these uh, simulated line scans. Real world noise, real world errors. And then how well will the model extend uh, when we get to really, really small features, say 5 nanometer, 7 nanometer feature sizes. All very interesting topics and uh, I hope that myself and hopefully other people will continue this work. Thank you. Oh, before I quit. Uh, acknowledgements. Can't forget the acknowledgements. Of course, John Villaruba provided us uh, with his J. Monsell code and uh, had very, very good discussions with, with us and very good suggestions. Ben Bundy also has a large number of people at both NIST and Semitech and Semitech member companies who were helpful in this work. So thank you to all of those. Thanks.